Eddie, wonderful Hi, to see you. Great to see you. Yeah, it's been some time. Yes. Thank you for joining me on what will be the first of many conversations uh, over live webinar. I've been uh, very excited to get you on, considering that you know we've spoken a number of times over the last few years, and each time leaves me wondering more than when I came in. And I always find that to be the marker of a good quality conversation when you leave with some more knowledge, but with even more questions. So it's nice to, to have you here or for myself to uh, ask you a number of questions about the work that you're doing. Thank you very much for this uh, intro. I must say that in scientists, that's what we're doing. We're asking you questions that open questions. So I'm sorry for that. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, it's only a few sleepless nights, but hopefully this will uh, allow me to rest more seamlessly. But the the reason I'm really excited to speak to you, and I'm sure that the audience would be excited to understand, um, you know, the work that you're doing is you are, in my opinion, at the forefront of cannabinoid research. And I don't know any other researcher on the planet that is looking at the cannabinoid profile as um, as specifically as you are. So to kind of give the audience a bit of context, do you want to just give a, a background about the work that you're doing at the Technion and, and a little bit as a little bit of a background as to how you got into the Technion and why cannabis? Okay, so um, I have a bachelor in biology, a master's in biochemistry, PhD in molecular and genetic plant biology. I'm very into plants, so I have a PhD in plant biology, but also I'm a son of agriculture. We had a big farm, and for three years I was the head of the farm when my father was sick. I was seven years the head of the botanic gardens of the Tel Aviv University, so I'm very knowledgeable about plant. I would say that plants are coming easily to me. Mm -hmm. um, but then I went to postdoc in Toronto, where I did four years cancer research. And when I got back to the Technion, I got a lab uh, in the TICC, the Technion Integrated Cancer Center, which is a laboratory for cancer research. But I thought that I will have a kind of advantage if I will do a research with plants. So I look for a good candidate that can affect cancer, like plants that can, that can affect the cancer. And there was a bunch of, of publications by Manuel Guzman and Christine Sanchez from Spain that shown on glioblastoma and breast cancer, that cannabis can affect cancer. But more than that, there was a publication by a Japanese group that quote one of my work and show that a, a protein that I defined in my postdoc being affected by, by cannabis and it's blocking the ability to migrate. And I thought it's a very good candidate as a plant. It was a little bit before the hype and everything started. So it was around five, almost six years ago. So it was before the big no noise of, of cannabis was the beginning. So I started to do a research, but quite fast I realized that there is a huge problem in the field, which people are focusing on THC and CBD, where the cannabis is harboring many other compounds. You know, what look today to every audience and every people, oh, sure, there is also CBG and uh, CBN and a lot of cannabinoids and terpenoids and flavonoids. Wasn't clear six years ago. People focus on two cannabinoids. So I went to speak with Rafi Meshulam, who is the, the, the you know, the, the king or the, uh, the you know, godfather. The, the, the godfather of, of the field of cannabinoids. He's the one that uh, uh, realized that there are cannabinoids in the 60s. He, he identified CBD and then THC and showed that THC is the psychoactive and then the endocannabinoid system that we have in our uh, uh, own body. And I went to speak with him and I realized that there is a lot of cannabinoids, but I can't identify them because it's very complicate to collaborate with cannabis. You can't, like I have a license to work with cannabis in my lab, but you can't drive with that or use other laboratories because the, the, the license is to work in, the, in, in your lab. I had to become kind of holistic lab that doing everything from bottom to top. And the first thing that we understood that different types of cannabis, different strains, if you call them, or chemotype or chemoverse, affect different the cells. So you have one high THC strain that's killing breast cancer and other high THC strains that are not killing. 
So we had to look inside. And what we did in the last few years, we create tools to analyze all the active compounds, all the cannabinoids. We can analyze around 140 phytocannabinoids from the plant, around 120, even more, 150 terpenes or terpenoids, around 40 flavonoids. And in the endocannabinoid system, when we're taking a blood, a blood sample, we can analyze around 150 endocannabinoids. Mm. You know, people know anandamide to a G, but like the cannabis, there are more than 100 endocannabinoids. And the receptors, the one that capture the phytocannabinoids or the endocannabinoids, then they transfer the signal to our body, the, 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 the receptors. People are familiar with CB1, CB2, maybe GPR55. My lab today working with the 38 different receptors. So we first of all create the tools to do this research. But creating these tools create kind of centralize my lab that a lot of growers, startups, scientists, physicians that doing work came to us to collaborate that we can analyze the endocannabinoid system and the cannabis. And this has changed my lab in a way that we started to do research with people that I thought it would be good to collaborate with or with people that were, had a good result. It was very interesting for me. And my lab group grew and grew, grew and grow more and more. And, and from seven, six students, we grow to 42 students. We have groups. So we have in today in my lab, on top of the cancer research and the chemist analysis of all the identification and and separation and isolation that we're doing, we have a research on neurobiology. So we have epilepsy, Alzheimer's, sleep disorder, multiple sclerosis, sleep disorders, all of this related to our neurons and neurobiology. And, and, and I have a group that doing that. And we're looking how cannabis affect the immune system because one of the major effect of the cannabis is on our immune system. So we have a group that uh, doing a study of autoimmune uh, diseases, IBD and other diseases. And I have a group that doing data collection, uh, uh, which we understood that we actually, uh, at least five years ago, four years ago, we were the only lab in the world that know what the patient is getting. So in Israel, we have, uh, uh, from 2007, we have medical cannabis. So cannabis in Israel been given to patients under prescription of a physician by control by the healthcare and sponsored by the healthcare. So Israel is kind of a, you know, a partial social country. So the healthcare in Israel is free. You, when you're getting a prescription, you're getting the medicine being sponsored. You, you're paying like very simple amount, you know, you can pay $5 for a medicine that costs $10,000. So cannabis is under healthcare. You're getting your prescription, you're paying a fixed price, and it doesn't matter what you're getting and what, how much you're getting. And today we have in Israel more than 60,000 patients that are getting cannabis under prescription. But what they are getting, they're getting around 100 different types of cannabis. Five years ago, people looked on that high THC, high CBD, that's it. But we came with the idea that every cannabis is actually different can different medicine. And, and if you ask people that are, you know, patient or stoners, doesn't matter, people that are using cannabis, they know that one is increasing your appetite and does one is does one you make you very sleepy and the other make you very alert. And it's clear because they have different profile of compounds, of chemicals inside. So we understood that we are the only lab that know what the patient is getting. And we got a, a huge funding with a foundation called the Ed, Evelyn Lipper Foundation from United States to create the Israeli database to follow up what the patient is getting to every time that the grower pick a batch or, or, or make a product, we get a sample analyzing what you, we have inside and then doing follow up on the patient. And the idea is to create a database with a, you know artificial intelligence to understand and to match that what the patient is getting and what is helping that in from that to the elimination and understand what are the compounds. So this is another big group in my lab. And I will say these are the major four group in research in my lab. So I, there's so much to unpack there. I'm particularly curious about the fact that Israel recently has been 
has overtaken Germany as the largest exporter of cannabis flour in the world. So now you're starting to see an importation uh, increase in products coming from like Canada and Germany. How is that impacting your current research? Are you guys actually looking at what's coming in from overseas as well as what's currently being grown in Israel? So, so first, yes, you know, today I got from one of the companies a four package that they just import from Canada. Daddy, please check that and, and see what it is inside. You know, they are using me and I'm using them because they, they're not paying to me and I'm doing all the analysis, verifying that what they got is real, right? But <laughs> on, the, on the same time, I'm getting a lot of data about that. I can't say that I can follow everything. Israel changed a, a year ago, while until a year ago, we had eight authorized growers they grow all the cannabis. So it was something that I can follow up. Every grower produced around 10 different strains. So altogether, I had between 90 to 100 products. Israel changed the way they grow and open it to every grower that want to grow and can have a license. So first of all, from eight, we have today around 15 to 20 uh, different growers. Uh, second, there is import, so it's become a little bit too big for me to follow up on everything. So I'm follow up on on more specific group. We are participating in 11 clinical trials, and from these trials, I'm getting much more accurate data with blood samples, checking the endocannabinoid system. So what I did in the last year and a half, I started to focus and narrow down my very wide database that I did before. I just changed. The, the way I am approaching that because it's become a little bit too big, too wide. Okay, so then what are your parameters for what you're focusing on if you're if you're kind of cutting it down? Where where do you focus? You know, are you with because I'm particularly interested in, you know, in Australia, for example, there is a plethora of different products that are available. And a large part of that is due to the fact that Australia is probably the easiest country to import product to. And it's one of the fastest growing patient markets or patient populations on the planet, um, um, you know, per capita. But the issue is you can't test quality into a product. So there's these products that are coming in that the starting material might be cultivated on a hemp farm in a particular part of the world. Um, and the extraction occurs in a particular lab in, you know, whatever the country is. And there are all these different standards and procedures that create a product that is somewhat of a what i don't want to call it a frankenstein but it's the simplest term so i want to understand the products that are coming into israel do you note that there's a difference in the quality of these materials does it affect the end product for patients and then how are you then determining what products you're going to pick and choose and is any of it based on that quality so first of all, there are products that are very different. You know, there are cannabinoids that I never saw in Israel, but I see from products that we import, like CBT. I can't tell you how it's affect, but I know that it's different. I, you have 1.2, 1.5% CBT on, mm. on a product that coming from Canada, which I never saw in Israel. And now the question, is it important how it's affecting? And I don't know. It, it, one of the problems with this database, it's a huge mess. We're talking about cannabis. People are using more than one strain. They're using high CBD in the morning, high C ITC in the evening. They are changing, they are transferring. Part of that using a little bit of recreational, a little bit, there is a big mess. They are not mm. taking one more, one medicine that they can follow up as we used to in medicine usually, okay? So you're taking two products or three products one is all, one is flowers, that every one of them contain hundreds of different compounds, and you change it every two or three months, it's creating a huge mess. One of my advantage in the database that I create, and I learned it just recently, I had a contact with thousands of patients, okay? And let's take the COVID-19, okay? I want to check now if patients are using chronically cannabis are less affected by COVID-19. I can send an email to 10,000 patients in one press the button and ask how, ma how many of you were sick with COVID-19 in the last two months and see if there is a difference between the general population and the one that's using cannabis. So, so you understand, I have the tool to, to connect to thousands of patients 
and to ask them and to know what they are taking because I know what they are taking or, already, and mm. to ask them specific uh, question, make it much more powerful than just the database that I collect. So let's say something very general, okay? Somebody is coming to me and said, Daddy, I believe that cannabis is kind of helping the, the women period to be more organized, okay? Very general, right? I can send a, a questionnaire to 5,000 women that I know what cannabis they are using and see if, if there is something in this uh, a comment, if there is something about it. If I want now to ask patients that have IBD, inflammation, bowel disease, okay? What's happened if they are changing from CBD to TT? I have a tool to have thousands of, of, of patients in one day or in few hours and get the data when I already know which cannabis they are using. This is very powerful. And this is a lot of what we're doing <coughs> recently in the last year, asking more specific questions to more central groups. Yeah, but so what I'm... <coughs> So what confuses me then with what you've just said there with the, with the, so if I'm using a cannabis product in the morning and, you know, it metabolizes at a particular pace and then I'm using another cannabis product in the evening, how can you get accurate data on and, and, and actually understand what is leading to the effect of symptom relief for patient A? Is it a combination of these two? Is it one specific like that? That is messy. How do you account for that then? So first of all, it's really messy. And, and that, that's my uh, criticism to myself, okay? I believed four years ago, and, and unfortunately, I, I spent $5 million on that, okay? I burned tons of money. I, I wish I can get the money back. So, uh, you know, and this is one of my criticisms. I thought, very simple. I will collect that on the, on the strains. I collect that on the patient, and I will align that together, and I will know but starting to collect the data and get the data and get big numbers, I understand how much it's messy. I can't really know <clears throat> how the CBD that you took in the morning affect the evening, how much is saying in the blood, how much is mixture. So we are doing a few things. We're trying to see it collectively. We said, okay, how much milligram THC per day? So we look on every cannabis and connect, combine them together. We said, this is what is taken chronically all the month. Let's combine that together and look on microgram per microgram per kilogram per cannabinoids. To tell you that it's a good approach, I don't know. We're getting data from that. We're learning from that, but it's much more complicated. So part of the part of the patient using one strain, one chemogram, it's easier. The one that combining. It's more, more, uh, more complicated, and this is this is one of the problems of the database. It's there is tons of problems of the database. It's not the only one. So you know, what's the one that you scratch your head over the most? Is that it? I think this is the this is the, my major problem. Yeah, the 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 two problem. One of the combining different materials. Second, it's the consistency. So. Cons, how to say that? To Consistency. Correct? Consistency. <laughs> okay, sorry. So, oh, good. try to speak Hebrew. It's, uh, you know, it's more complex. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. so, one of my problems is, is the consistency because what patients are changing products. Mm. If, they, if we were taking the same product for half a year, it was easier for me. But he's taking one product. And then next one month is changing to different product and then taking and have leftover from last month that is still using, make it very complicated and messy. Still, I think we are much better placed from other people that don't know what the patient is taking, but there are a lot of problems to recruit accurate data from this database. It's a problem. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of businesses that have set up around Canada um, in particular that, that are building these businesses around data collation. I'd never actually thought about that before, the issue around mixed products um, and how that implicate, what the implications on that are for understanding how a product actually treats a patient. Because you might have a patient in Australia that's using a particular product from company A in the morning and then a different product in the evening. 
you, you, yeah, it's, it's hard to ascertain what's actually working because there are going to be trace elements of cannabinoids still in the system. It's quite well documented. Oh, Adam, do you know how many companies like that came to me very excited and I, I did a spoiler to them? <laughs> so people, you know, there are companies that, yeah, we collected data, we know everything. How do you know what are the compounds that the patient is taking? Which cannabis is taking cannabis? You're collecting data. Which cannabis is taking? How mm. much is taking? How much is mixing between them? This usually these data are so messy that we almost can't learn anything from them. I have huge criticism. I try to look in, I don't want to say names of companies, but that you know, oh, we have 800, uh, you know, point of data collection from patient. Okay, but except knowing that he's using a dark blueberry, what is dark blueberry? Which, what are the content of the cannabinoids and terpenoids inside of them? Mm. What, what, you know, I, I have a very good friend, uh, Rigi from CPL. I, I, I guess few people here know him. And when he still works in Stipple, now he's working in a different company that's been bought. Uh, but when he's working in Stipple, he did very interesting uh, work. He looked on White Widow in California and he collected 20 different White Widow from 20 different growers and showed that not just the content of this uh, uh, White Widow is different, also different grower called different genetic White Widow. So even mm. genetically, it's not the same plant. So if I will tell you, yes, somebody is using white widow in California and it was really helping him to sleep. What are you learning from that? Almost zero. What was the content of the cannabinoid? What is the amount that he used? How, what is the way that he used it? It's almost meaningless. Yeah, kind of, it makes me think that classifying cannabis as a pharmaceutical is just not going to work. It's, it, it's, there's too many variables. There's too many kind of inconsistency pieces there. So it would better it would be it, it'd serve a better purpose if it was a herbal remedy in in and treated as a, a, a as an alternative medicine i mean that's based on what you're sharing that's kind of where so my Adam, mind leading me what are your thoughts on this i believe that the cannabis field will go in two roads okay mm. one is more pharma oriented specific products that you keep them always the same the same or as a whole plant, the same way of product growing indoor that you're keeping everything together and you did the clinical trials and you know the amount to take and you know what are the compounds, you understand what he's doing. And this is a product, is a medicine product. And there will be a, 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 a arm which is kind of treating a more a quality of life. Mm -hmm. A little bit improving appetite, improving your sleep, helping on that. And this product will be much more general. So I will give you an example. There is one company in Israel that grows a specific strain that is the best one for epilepsy in Israel, by far. Even better than, you know, the epidiolex and everything that being go through. And we see that it's always 20, 25% better than the, all the other high CBD strain. So they already know, and they're growing this in the same way from 2007. There are more than, I would say, more than 1,000 kids in Israel that getting this strain for years. We know it's working and, and they will produce a, a product. They will give it a name. They will branch it. They will do a clinical trial and this will be sold for epilepsy. Let's say like Charlotte Webb, okay? Mm. This is a specific product that you keep them and you know that this is helping for that indication. But this is one arm, narrow arm that will be very medical. And there will be another arm which will be cannabis. More general, more on, uh, as you said, you know. Health and wellness. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's I believe the, the field will go in, in the years, yeah. you know. And yeah, that makes working, sense. we are working with company. We are defining for them exactly where are the, what are the compounds that give them the 25% better. And when they will understand that they can keep it always, they can go to pharma, synthesize it, whatever. But in the plant, you know, field, the cannabis, the whole plant, they at least will know what to keep always the same. Mm. So precision growing is essential then for that route to occur. Because ultimately, I, if you're able to consistently, yeah, you have to. You have to. You, uh, but also, but also as an IP on the business side, this is a way 
to pr to protect your product if mm. you say okay this is my product these are all the cannabis this is all the terpenes and i'm giving them this uh, you know service these are all what you have this is the genetic we're growing that in that way and it's good for this indication then you can protect protect it you can have an ip if you will grow it every time in a different way and you get you can protect it it's a plant and, and these companies that already worth hundreds of millions of dollars want to protect their product and this is the way they are working mm, okay so and this is the reason I, I, i'm getting a lot of money from them well this is helpful it may continue to succeed on that direction we have but doing research what i feel that the audience would love to know Daddy, what are the three cannabinoids you're most excited about right now and why? So, you know, I have four kids. Ask me which one I love the most, you know? It's not, it's not well, a fair question. It's, it's not so, about what you love you the most. It's more like, you know, you've got four kids. Which one are you most excited to see on that particular day and why? It could change. It's interchangeable. It's fine. But if you, yeah, yeah. If you can give me some... First of all, it's very cute. I see that you don't have kids. It's not working that way. But 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 in general, okay, I will say I, I will separate. You know, we have few type of research, and in every one of them, we defining which are the cannabinoids which are important. And there are unique cannabinoids. First of all, I don't know if to say unfortunately or not unfortunately. It's never ended till now with one cannabinoid. It's always a combination of two or three cannabinoids. I don't have any research that it's more than three, and I have any research that it's one. It's always two or three, okay? Mm. And this is what we call the entourage effect or whatever, and I can explain, I need hours, but I explain, you know, it's attacking different receptors. I, I can touch that in a moment, okay? But in mm. every one of them, there are at least one unique cannabinoids part of them doesn't even have a name you know 37315b 118b whatever we give them a name but it's unknown cannabinoid we call them minor cannabinoids in in, in cannabis but it's a it's a wrong termination because if you have 1.5 percent of a specific cannabinoid let's say 373115b okay 1.5 percent it's a lot when you're using one joint when you mm. smoke one gram of cannabis 1.5 percent is 15 milligram which is a lot as a medicine mm. so it's not minor at all okay and we've seen every indication in leukemia in breast cancer in epilepsy in in alzheimer in every one of them that we define already the cannabinoid that we need that there are the major one, there is CBD or CBDV or whatever, and another one that is kind of unique that boosts it. And, and I'm excited about this one. This side, the unique one, that you see that they're binding TRPV1, changing the calcium. We're already starting to understand what they are doing and why. So this is very exciting. So, so let me, you know, um, go a little bit further from your question and explain something my theory about the entourage effect okay awesome let's do there it is something, there, there is something that called a, a, a poly a pharmacology a, and it's starting to be more and more acceptable in, in in medicine so until 10 years ago the 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 medicine from you know from the 40s the 50s started to start to isolate one molecule the target something very specific. We call it one molecule, one target. And if you take 98% of the medicine that you can buy as a medicine or get a treatment, it's one molecule that target one target. But we reach kind of a, a you know, kind of a, a, a ceiling with this treatment. And there was few diseases, and the major one is HIV right, the AIDS, that we tried to treat this virus for many years and didn't succeed. And then there was few ideas that said, look, there is this medicine that a little bit help, this medicine that a little bit help, and this medicine that a little bit help. If we will create a cocktail, maybe we can help this, this patient. And they create a cocktail and it's actually 
solve the problems of HIV. Today, it is the patient getting a cocktails of medicine, which help them. And this open the door. Today, in cancer, you treat with chemotherapy and radiation, but usually you're not treating with one therapy, you're giving a cocktail. And the idea that you are targeting the cell from different angles, okay? You're attacking from here, from here, and from here. And you're getting a complicated action, which called polypharmacology, you poly materials that are attacking from each different. Now mm, go to mm. plant or go to cannabis, you actually have poly, polypharmacology, harboring in one plant, right? You have mm. 144 cannabinoids, you have terpene, you have flavonoids, and they're attacking the cell from different angle. And mm. even taking the leukemia, we're already very advanced and we're starting clinical trial. I see that I need three molecules. And I already know that one of them is binding CB2 receptor, one of them is binding TRPV receptors. Together, they are releasing calcium from the mitochondria in ER, creating ER stress, elevating a specific protein that blocking the leukemia pathway. But if you're taking any one of them, it's not enough to get this action. You're kind of attacking the cells from different angles, and this is the reason I need three molecules. So if I'm looking in general on cannabis, I see that more and more, that that's what happened. You're getting a very complicated action that crosses this barrier. If you think about the Bushmen, you know, 1,000 years ago in Australia, you still, I guess, have it. Sorry if I'm wrong about that, okay? And he's going to his chief, you know, Chief Papa or whatever, the Indian, and in the sense that, hey, you know, I have a migraine, I can't, you know, I see black. He's going and picking one leaf from here, one flower of him, take a road from one plant, combine them together and give it. He's creating polypharmacology. He's taking something that from here, from here, and from here. It's too complicated from the medicines today to the physician, but mm. the field, the, the 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 medicine is starting to go that direction and i think cannabis has opened the door to plant biology or, or medical plant biology which till today was a little bit too complex we said okay you know if we understand we can take one molecule from the plant synthesize it and use it fine if it's complicated don't touch it and we have many 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 plants that we are now that being used as a medicine, medicine for thousand years is just too complicated. And today we it's opened the door. If you look on my my lab today, if you ask me, I don't see myself just as a cannabis research. Today I have all the tools to take any plant in the world to look inside to understand what are the chemicals the compound there, and then to narrow down which combinations of compounds I need to get in action. So I have two students and two students that collect. 96 different algae from the Mediterranean Sea. We create extract from this algae. We screen it on many diseases. We define on which diseases we see effect. And now we start it to narrow down, define what are the molecules that are doing that. We can do it to fungi. We can do it to different uh, plants that coming from the Amazon. You know, I'm very good friend from uh, uh, John Amazon, uh, Olivia Newton, John Husband, and we are dreaming to get the collections from him and check that. So. I see how I built something around the cannabis that now can apply to other plants, other medicines. I have all the tools, all the ability. I have all the tools to do different types of extraction because it's cannabis. We, we, we're using a press, a, a ethanol extraction, CO2 supercritical, butane. I have all the extraction method in the lab. I have. LCMS, GCMS, HPLC, all the analy analytical tools to analyze and separate these molecules. I have in my lab epilepsy, Alzheimer's, sleep disorder, multiple sclerosis, cancer, psoriasis, like many mice model and plant model that I can screen that. So actually I can take any kind of plant that I think it's a medicine and do mm. what I did in cannabis. And this is extremely exciting. Not that I'm Abandoning cannabis, I'm just starting to look expanding, on new things. Expanding, expanding horizons. But, but I mean, of all the botanical products that you've come across, 
cannabis by far seems in my view one of the most interesting because you've got such a rich more than what 700 plus compounds present in in any given plant so the the combination the sequences here are somewhat endless so how are you then deciphering through all of these different inputs what are the key focus points so you you just mentioned that it's roughly between two to three particular compounds per indication so what we're doing adam our, my methodology always i'm starting with very wide screen i have the tools in my lab to do high put through screening so i have machines robots that can screen a lot of samples very fast so let's take cancer I, i'm starting to work with the specific colon cancer i'm taking the cells and grow them in a plate that have 96 different holes in this plate okay mm. and i'm taking this plate in every one of i'm growing the cells in this plate in every well i'm using different chemovar of cannabis 96 of them i put it in the machine in this incubator which is also a microscopy they take images from each well live imaging and can take 1000 images an hour so after 24 hours i have a clue which cannabis affect most mostly the these types of cells and when i'm finding that and proving that it's not so simple and i'm screening a lot but when i'm defining that that i'm starting to look deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper i say okay this is the cannabis that worked for me the best you have 700 compounds then i have tools to separate them and separate them to five groups okay let's make it simple it's 700 compounds separate to seven groups 100 compounds in each group. I'm coming back to the cell, screening again, saying, hey, fraction four works for me the best. So I already eliminate 600. I'm staying with 100. I'm starting to do fraction again, and again, and again, and again, in combination. It can take one month, it can take three months. But in the end, I'm getting the minimum compounds that are doing the effect. Usually it's ended with two or three, usually, not always. Not always it's success, not always it's, it's so simple. But I narrow it down. So if I will take all these 700 compounds and starting to do the combination, it's unendless. So I'm going, my approach is on the other, other way. I'm starting with screening all the chemovars that I have. I define which one is working the best. And then I'm starting to narrow it down systematically until I'm reaching single compounds are doing single effect and then i'm starting to learn the biology why these compounds are doing this effect why you need both of them which receptor they are binding what are the single single signals they are sending to the cells Under, understanding that make it a wide game so let me give you an example okay i'm working on inflammation or whatever you see that two compounds is blocking the cells the, the the immune cells to migrate from one place to another and when i'm understanding the mechanism which protein they degraded what they're doing now it's open it wider you said okay so this can be good for a, a inflammatory bowel disease but it can be also good to this disease and it can be also good for that disease yep, and yep, then yep. starting wider so Are you, it what's so what? simple it wasn't complicated you know yeah <laughs> No one ever said it was going to be easy. But then my question is, following that, are you seeing any trends with particular cannabinoids for particular indications? So is, for example, let's just use CBG as, a, as, a, as the first thing that comes to, to mind. Yes, CBG might be good for a particular indication, but are there cannabinoids that are working on multiple indications that are having an impact on different, um, 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 having different efficacy for particular outcomes of, you know, symptom relief? Sure, sure. So, so you know, we have receptors in all our body, in every cell in our body, we have uh, endocannabinoid receptors. I didn't so, uh, I didn't see till today any cells in our body that don't have kind of combination of receptors. A and think about it. What are the receptors? They are proteins that sitting on the membrane of the cell, that capturing the cannabinoids and giving signals. So, if you have a combination of one receptor, so one cell. You will get one message from these cannabinoids, but the other cells is not in the opposite. So it's even more complicated. But if CBD is sending a, a signal to a neuron, it's one type of signal, but to immune system, it's totally different signal. Mm. So when our body 
is sending these signals internally. You know, you smelling, I'm always giving this example, so sorry for that. You smelling a barbecue and small molecules entering to your nose, going to our olfactory signal, signaling to a neuron that produce specific endocannabinoid, binding specific receptors, send a signal to our pancreas to create insulin, and there is a feedback loop that increases our appetite. So smelling a barbecue and increase our appetite, or smelling a good dish and increase up our appetite, it's our endocannabinoid system. But this is very specific. This endocannabinoid producing here and sending a signal here, it's not affecting our immune system in our elbow, okay? But when you're taking cannabis, you take it systematically. So mm -hmm. here, it will bind these receptors and increase your appetite, but here it will affect your immune system. And this is the reason cannabis, when you're taking, you're taking cannabis systematically, you affect, you increase your appetite, but you're also feeling sleepy. You have, you're feeling a little bit high, but it's also affecting your immune system. You're affecting a lot of things. So answering your, your question, yes, cannabinoids, every cannabinoid will have different effect in different diseases, but will have a multiple effect. So what are the, then, what, what that got me thinking about is some of the surprising items that you've discovered since researching into cannabis. So like, let's say you are using your application, you've got a patient that's using cannabis to treat their inflammatory bowel disorder. Are there any instances where you've seen a patient use cannabis for one particular treatment, but have found that they are now um, finding relief in other areas of their life? So well-being or better quality sleep, oh, like what, sure, what are some of the surprising Sure, sure. You know, this is kind of what we are always trying to see at the general thing. So you see a patient that taking cannabis for pain, but stop taking his pill for a, a blood pressure. Okay. And then you see it more and more and more and say, just a moment, there is something about it. Why this patient starting to take a pill for blood pressure? And you realize that the cannabis is a side effect kind of bringing the blood pressure to, to homeostasis again, okay? Like mm. to the right place. Or, or you know, sugar in the blood, a cholesterol. We see kind of side effects that affecting that you are, you don't get the cannabis for that, but you see the effect. And this is, we, said that, we see that a lot. It's open a lot of a, a specific research in the lab. This kind of, of indication, you know? Hey, just a moment, this is not what I suspect, but I see that and it's very interesting. Let's check it more deeply. If, if I answer your question. Yeah, yeah, that, that's it. I find that fascinating because I, I want to know, th th there's going to be instances where people are taking cannabis to treat a particular indication, but there will be flow on effects where they start to improve their sleep quality. And then as a result of the improvement of sleep quality, their anxiety starts to drop because they're having more quality sleep. So reducing, you know, poor sleep, from, let's say five hours a night of, of restless sleep to seven to eight hours a night of more deep sleep. So that's going to have a flow on effect. So I, I asked myself, what are the kind of net benefits for using cannabis for a particular indication? And then what are some of the kind of trends that you're seeing where patients are now starting to gain more relief from other um, effects that they didn't necessarily kind of buy into. So, you know, that better quality sleep piece. So, so, so Adam, that's what I said before. And I'm, I'm, that's, that's what I believe today after five years work with cannabis, 80% of the patient using cannabis at the improving quality of life. So in general, it's very difficult to put the finger what in the quality of life you really change to change the quality of life of the patient. Because this patient suffered from pain, he didn't sleep, he had anxiety, he took a lot of other medicines that create side effects, okay? And now he's starting to take cannabis because of the relief of pain, but he's sleeping better, eating better, have better mood, uh, 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 less pain, in general, all his quality of life is starting to take opioids. He's starting to take uh, medicines for his anxiety. Mm. And it's very difficult to understand what in this complex 
the candidates exactly do and what is what is the egg and what is the chicken right mm, mm. but in general it's affecting quality of life this is 80 percent of the patient 80 percent it's the huge it's the major there are patients that taking cannabis for a very 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 specific neuroindication and the most clear and and easy to get it's epilepsy mm. we have a child with 50 seizures a day if you're fixing the seizures if you're reducing the seizures to one seizure a day or zero then he's become a normal child and then you look for cannabis that reducing seizure you don't care about the sleep and the appetite and the mood and everything you just need to reduce the seizures so the best thing will be a medicine or, a, or, or, or a, a, a plant that affecting the seizures, but as less much as the other thing. You don't need to make it better sleep. You don't, if you just reduce the seizure, you cure or you treat the, the illness. So there are very specific indications like that, that you need to uh, uh, treat something very defined. So, you know, my major research is cancer. Okay, mm -hmm. so in, in, in leukemia, or let's say in breast cancer, two major results that we have. My major goal is to kill the cancer cells. I don't care now if the patient is sleeping more or less. Sorry for that. I don't care if he's suffering from more pain or not. I'm saving his life. I want to cure the cancer. I want to kill the cells. So I'm not looking about quality of life now. I'm looking on very specific thing, very specific indication. I'm very focused. What is the best combination, best ratio of molecules that kill the cells most efficiently? Mm. And this is, but this is much more narrow in the cannabis field because the majority taking cannabis to improving sleep, reducing pain, reduce anxiety and, 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 and things like that and this would give you a, a much better pattern of, of quality of life so let's 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 separate quality of life and and severe um symptom belief for you know a, a, a disease state right do you see that for the disease states let's say someone's taking a particular strain or a particular i don't even like saying strain but a particular set of of, of compounds are they increasing this, decreasing this? What are you noticing from a trends perspective of the consumption rate for disease um, indications? And you can be broad if you want, but, and also then on the other side for health and wellness, are people getting to a particular threshold and then they, they just manage? Is it up and down? H how do you see the data? What is the data telling you about consumption of cannabis for severe diseases versus health and wellness? Um, can you talk about that for a bit? Because I think that's very interesting because in Australia, some of the data shows that THC, for example, over time, it's just, it's an increase. You get to that point where you are building that tolerance and then it's just an increase and an increase and an increase. Does it stabilize? Is it based on particular symptoms or indication that, uh, what is like kind of the normalization or the, the stabilized point um, from the research that you've seen, if there's any at all? So first of all, regarding tolerance, the tolerance created by desynthesize the, uh, the receptors, okay? So our body building, it put receptors on, on, on the membrane of the cells to capture the molecules and give signals. When you have over, what it's doing is reducing the amount of receptors. So let, let, give you, let me give you an example, okay? You need 100 pools of CB1 receptors to send the specific signals. So the, the, the cell put 50 receptors on the cell and said every one of them will capture two uh, anandamides and I will get this pulse, okay? But if now you're taking THC and then you're floating the cells, you're getting 1,000 inputs every second, which is there. So what the cell is doing, instead of putting 50 receptors on the cell, it will put just two because it's enough to get this input and you want, you don't want to get it. It's like kind of protecting himself, okay? And what it's creating, you're creating tolerance. In order to get, you need more and more and more because you have less receptors, okay? What we are doing with patients in Israel, sometimes we're doing what we call washout. You are stopping 
for 10 days, seven days to 10 days. So the body, the cells now don't have this uh, output, uh, uh, incomes of, of THC and, and other cannabinoids. And it started to produce the receptors again on the membrane. So you can start again from low. So this is the first thing that can solve this problem, and it's working quite well. Um, but this is the reason for the tolerance. It's, it's simple biology, okay? Mm. Um, it doesn't mean that you improve the treatment when you increase and increase. And, and, and I, I don't think it's a, it's a good approach to increase the amount more and more because of the tolerance. Just bring you, yourself back to kind of, uh, you know, baseline. And, a um, but I don't remember your, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember your question. Yeah, so, so a patient's increasing in Israel for chronic diseases. Do patients tend to increase over time? Is there a stabilization point? Yeah, so, so first of all, the, because it's under a prescription, the physician don't let the patient to increase so much. You know, there is a level of, of amount that they don't like to go above that. And you need to be or suffer to something very severe to go more than that. What we see majorly is that part of the patient taking higher and higher level of THC, but the most of them are stabilized about a, a one kind of amount. Also, they're starting with strain with very high THC level, let's say 22%, 21%, and going down to strain that they have 40, not a very strong one. Because in general, people that are really patient, okay, he want, he's suffering from pain, but he wants to take his medicine and go to work. So he don't want to be very, you know, totally out. He want to be in, in a place that he still can function. So patients usually reduce uh, or taking strength that are less uh, uh, psychoactive than, than in normal and, and stabilize in, in a specific amount. They reach the amount that work for them, reach the combination that works on them and start to stabilize there. Are, are you seeing any of the groups in Israel adding additional terpenes to their products to increase efficacy or to create a particular outcome for, uh, for patients? Are there, are there anyone playing with terpenes at the moment? No. Uh, again, in Israel, it's very under control on, on the, the medical side. So you can you don't have this ability, like you can't play with it. You're getting the, the material from the pharmacy, but you don't have the option to take turpins now and to add, but the answer is no, zero. I, I don't familiar with that at all. What are your thoughts on doing things like this? Like, let's say I've got a, a high THC product for simplicity's sake, and I add, you know, additional beta caryophylline um, to increase the analgesic properties. W what are your thoughts on this? Because that, I mean, that, from a kind of one plus one equals two, that's how I would imagine companies should start to think, uh, looking at different cannabinoid and terpenoid combinations, because there's the terpenes are well documented for a variety of different um, therapeutic applications. So what would be the benefit then of taking, you know, a particular strain and enhancing it with terpenoids? Yeah, look, I, I know this, uh, I don't want to say theory or this uh, approach, for many years, and I'm working with a company called Ibna in Israel that producing uh, terpenoids for years. Mm. And we tried, I don't have any good data to see really the effect of terpenoids that they enhance the, the, you know, the cannabis. Maybe on the recreational side, there is a better knowledge about that, but I'm not familiar with, with this. Uh, really data that's showing that it's enhanced an effect like you will sleep better if you combine now more terpenes or anything that I don't feel me like with really clinical trial or real data that's showing the, the synergism it's kind of common sense we mm. try to show that I didn't see that till today yeah so I'm you have familiar been... with data so that's, not, data. that's not in your lab have you looked at that at all we looked at that many times. So a lot of times I told you, well, you started with 700 compounds, you, you want to decrease them. We never till today saw that it's one tupins that are very important for the action or something like that. Mm. So I don't have data that's showing that. Uh, the tupins are important to other things and 
I really believed in that. I thought in sleep disorders, the terpenoids would be important. I don't have still today a good data that showing the terpenes are a major or doing synergism. If you ask me my belief, I think it's there. I just, I don't have that. data or I'm not familiar also with good study that shows synergism between cannabinoid and terpenoid. You know, there are people that I I will follow them with my eyes closed, like uh, Ethan Russo, mm. that, that believe in that and saying that. So I think if Ethan Russo believe in that, probably there is something in that. I never mm. saw good data showing that. Yeah, I, I find that fascinating. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting frontier. But I mean, with the breakdown of, like when you're doing the analysis of the cannabinoid and terpenoid and flavonoid profile, and you're whittling it down to that point where you've got those three particular molecules. Are those are any of those terpenes, or is it th is it cannabinoids? Just cannabinoids till today. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. That's a really interesting nugget I'm right there. Yeah, I must say. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe, I'm big believer in the flavonoids and the terpenoids, but I don't see that till today. It's a big question, you know. It's a big question when you when you have an extract in oil. You almost don't have terpenoids there anymore. When yeah. you're smoking yep. cannabis, how much of these terpenoids are evaporating out? How much? So, you know, we did this test actually a few weeks ago when we used very high levels of cannabis smoking and check immediately in the blood, like after half a minute, after 10 minutes, after half an hour, we didn't even see traces of terpenoids. So how much is really reaching the blood? I don't know to tell you. That's a fascinating. Why have you not recruited a PhD for that? Uh, who said that I don't? I just <laughs> okay. told you that I did this experiment two weeks ago. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. So, so... I, I, have, I have the PhDs that smoke the, the, the cannabis. I recruited for that, you know, I need that would have been. I'm sure it would have been very difficult to find people to smoke cannabis in Israel. <laughs> yeah. All right, okay. a couple, a couple. It's very difficult. Yeah, I, I want to ask the question. It's COVID period. I've been reading a lot of announcements around companies that are doing research into using cannabis to treat COVID. What are your thoughts on this? Because I think that's a pretty um, interesting position to take. And yeah, you're the best person I know to to to, to look at that. What are your thoughts with cannabis and COVID? So my lab, when the COVID started in, you know, March, April, and there was a shutdown in Israel, I got a, a license from the Technion and the Minister of Health to do a cannabis and COVID-19 research. And, and we're doing a little bit around that. In general, there is a, a, a logic or common sense to believe that cannabis will affect the COVID. Uh, because two reasons, the receptors of the COVID, the GPCR receptors and the cannabis is affecting that, affecting this expression. You know what, I won't touch on that too much, it's too complicated. On the other side, cannabis is affecting our immune system and our cytokines and chemokines release. And one of the major problems with the COVID-19 is the, the uh, cytokine storm. Actually, the cells in our lungs and the immune cells that reach uh, uh, secreting tons of cytokines that should, and chemokines that should uh, send a message to the body, we have an uh, infection here, come to help. But actually it's kind of harming itself. It's kind of autoimmune burst that cause the damage. So the people that are dying from COVID-19, COVID dying usually from respiratory problems, and lungs infection, which caused by the cytokine storm. So there is a reason to believe that cannabis can affect the cytokine storm. <laughs> the big question that we need to ask for ourselves, do we believe it can be the best treatment or a treatment that will be enough mm -hmm. to block them? And for that, I'm not sure. So in general, you know, Cannabis is a mild treatment. It's not a severe treatment. Our endocannabinoid system built to do mild things, to bring things to homostatic, the homostasis, to bring things to balance. So you have something that get out of balance and it's bringing it to balance. You smell 
A barbecue, it's a little bit increasing your appetite, you know? You hit your finger, it will reduce the pain here. But you know, the, our body have the endocannabinoids for a mild action, and usually a severe action to severe action. So I'm giving this example a lot, so I'm sorry for the audience that heard me more than once again, you know? If I'm hitting my, my finger now, you, you know, on something, I will feel a pain, but this pain will, uh, uh, I will feel a, re a relief in, in seconds, right? You hit something, you feel a pain, this pain relief in seconds. This is the endocannabinoid system. Very lo localized area. And there is endocannabinoids that will, will release from, a, from cells nearby and will reduce this pain. But it's a major, minor, you know, you hit your, you're running uh, with your bare feet, you hit the stone and you feel this pain for half a second really, really, okay? If I will be hardly wounded now, I will cut my hand totally, the body is not using endocannabinoids, it will produce opioids, right? Like morphine, it will mm -hmm. produce opioids to release the pain. There is a major penalty for severe action. You will be totally out. You won't be totally conscious. So I'll give you an example why you need this both action, the, the, the mild one and the severe one. There is, you know, the hunter is run after the deer, right? If every time that he will hit his finger, you will have opioids, he will never succeed to focus and to hunt the deer mm. you know he's running with his bare foot and 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 you feel the pain and and you navigate running bare feet with hitting stones or whatever but this is the endocannabinoid system treating them but he still focus and run after the deer until he's hunting them but if you are wounded severely you need to blow the bloodstream that's going to the wound you need to, to do, the body need to do severe things in order that the body will now stop running, sit down, focus on treating this wound. So you have a very mild action and very severe action. Two different systems, endocannabinoids and opioids. Mm. So now, this is one example, you know, how much you're hungry. If you're not eating two days, your intestine is shrinking, sending very severe signal to the brain to eat. Why? Because your body is already in a severe action. You didn't eat for two days. The body is starting to break muscles. You need energy. We are, we are a machine that needs energy to, to act. If when I'm speaking, I'm losing energy. I'm burning fuel. This fuel called ATP is coming from burning glucose usually. But if I'm not eating, I don't have fuel. So you're going to the batteries and starting to use the extra batteries, the, the muscles, the everything, right? So he's sending a severe messages to our brain to eat. You are not uh, concentrate anymore. You're just thinking about eating. You don't care about anything. You need to eat now. You're feeling hunger, very strong hunger. You're not concentrating. You have a bad breath, uh, you know, bad breath, everything. Okay, this is severe action. But now you are eating and you finish, you're already full, but evolutionary, keep eating, you don't know where is the next meal. So when the dessert coming, your brain is telling, hey, eat this, this is look good, keep eating, okay? Mm. But this is a mild action versus a severe action. So I'm going back to the COVID-19. The endocannabinoid system is built for mild actions. So I'm not sure that a severe action like COVID-19, inflammation, um, you know, a cytokine storm can be treated by the endocannabinoids. I'm not sure that we build in that way. So the answer was very complicated and long, but there is a reason to believe that cannabis can affect that. Mm. I'm not sure that it's strong enough to, to do the, the action that really saves the life of, of this are, patient. Are you seeing with any of the people in your database who are using cannabis, are they have building a, re is there a resistance or, or is it all the same? Are people using so cannabis that, and still? So the answer is that we checked that and we didn't see a significant 
uh, uh, changes in in uh, in the stat of people that using cannabis versus people not using cannabis. Even people that using chronically cannabis being affected by COVID nineteen. And now the question: Does he using the right cannabis with the right uh, you know uh, proportion? You know. So maybe there is a strain that can save you, but the, the most population not using that. So I think you'll find it if anyone. I'm, you know, there are many people that are doing good research and, and good labs. I guess, you know, I'm not the only one out there. Yeah, well, Daddy, it's uh, been past an hour. I could keep going. I've got, you know, plenty of questions, but I'll respect that uh, you're a busy man. I really appreciate your time, mate. It's an absolute pleasure to see you again face to face. I look forward to the next time uh, in person, hopefully, if that um, time will hopefully be soon. I'd love to come back to Israel. Meant to be there early this year, but yeah, fate played an interesting hand for us all, it seems. It's okay. I plan to be in Australia in August, which, you know, in, instead of that, we're speaking here. So good luck. Good it luck. Is what it is. I hope to be, you know, um, you know, Lucy Haslan sent me that she's planning to do a uh, conference ne next year and in then around this time. So maybe next year we still we will be able already to fly and, and meet face to face. And I really, really, really hope, uh, you know, to visit Australia soon. So love to see you there. I'd love to get you in this studio space. So, Daddy, good sir. Take care of yourself. All the best. Keep safe and keep your hands clean, huh? Thank you very much. Bye All bye. the best, Eddie. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, to everyone, for joining. I really appreciate it. And take care of yourselves. I'll be putting this live podcast webinar on a recorded version. So if anyone didn't tune in, they'll be able to uh, thank you again.